with the Avalon 64 X2 and the Pentium D in 2005. Both Intel and AMD showed that the way forwards for modern CPUs would be that of a multi-core design. However, that didn't mean that they stopped selling single-core CPUs. In the case of Intel, they continued to sell them for a good while under their Celeron line, which was the lowest tier of uh, consumer CPUs. And if we go from Netburst onwards to future generations, we first have Conroe, and for that they had six single-core Celerons. Then on Penryn in 2007, all these Celerons became dual-core with models like the E3500. Then Nehalem 2008, the desktop Celerons disappeared altogether. They did make a return in 2010 with Westmere, with the G1101, also a dual-core chip. And finally we have Sandy Bridge in 2011, uh, Sandy Bridge was a fantastic generation of CPUs, with legendary chips like the Quad-Core i5-2500K and i7-2600K. These were really fast, they were power efficient, they had massive overclocking headroom, they were just great chips. But Intel thought we have these great chips, but what consumers actually want is another single-core CPU. So they brought the single-core Celeron back, with not one, but with four models. Starting with the Celeron G440. One core, no hyper-threading and a 1.6 GHz clock speed and one megabyte of L3 cache. And then came three models with hyper-threading and 1.5 MB of L3 cache. The G460 at 1.8 GHz, the G465 at 1.9 and finally the G470 at 2 GHz, with the 470 supporting DDR3-1333. And all chips had a TDP of 35 watt. When I first found out about these chips, I had many questions, like what was Intel thinking, selling a single core CPU at this point in time? But also, what's the performance like, and could you play any games on it? Today I hope to answer some of those questions by having a look at this, the G465, the mid-range of this bottom-of-the-barrel silicon, so 1.9 GHz with hyper-threading, and one core. For the test setup, we'll be using this rather overkill ASRock Z77 workstation in combination with an even more overkill kit of 8GB DDR3-2400, a Cytomugen 4 cooler and an ASUS Matrix HD7970 Platinum. Let's start with boot time. As we do have support for SATA 3, you'd think booting would be rather quick, but even with an SSD it still took a lengthy 38 seconds to get to the Windows desktop. But finally here we are in Windows 10 Professional 64-bit. I've spent quite some time with this system and wow is it slow. Even running very rudimentary simple stuff, say browsing a website, it will very quickly pin the CPU at 100% utilization. As you can see here, scrolling through Ian Cutters' Ryzen 9 5980 article. And also, simple stuff like Steam, scrolling through the Steam store results in already a 50% utilization. YouTube is slightly better. We're still at full utilization here, but we can use the GPU for the decode. And we can just about manage a smooth 1080p60 playback. And keep in mind, this was with absolutely no background tasks running. Say for instance you're downloading a Steam game, or running a Windows update, or an antivirus. It'll easily put so much strain on the system that it'll pretty much crawl to a halt. As for the CPU characteristics, in terms of frequency, the CPU will alter between a 1600 MHz idle speed and the 1900 MHz base frequency, which it sustains under load. What is quite impressive is how little power it uses. Even though it's rated for a TDP of 35 watts, it'll idle at a CPU package power of around 6 to 7 watts, which only rises to around 10 to 11 watts under full load. So while it's slow, it doesn't use a lot of power either. And now for gaming performance. Even though I would have liked to have shown a wide range of games, many simply refuse to launch on a single core CPU, 
Like here with Battlefield 5, it'll attempt to launch and then simply quit. I did find a few titles that would somewhat work. Starting with GTA 5. After about 15 minutes of loading, slowly rendering in the assets one by one it seemed, it'll eventually run at a steady 12 to 15 FPS. A fun side note on the performance is that the GPU was so underutilized that it would keep switching between the idle and boost states. Next up is the best result I got with a somewhat modern title, Dirt Rally. With the very low preset, it was actually pretty playable, with FPS ranging from 40 to 55 in single car events. On to good old Minecraft. The G465 really struggled here with Minecraft's world generation, but after waiting for around 5 minutes, everything was loaded in and it would run at around 30 to 45 FPS for a brief moment after which something else would be loaded in and the FPS would tank completely. And because I did want to include some multiplayer, here's Battlefield 4, running at the low preset on a 32 player match. Not surprisingly, performance is dreadful, running around 14 FPS. Let's quantify the CPU performance with some benchmarks. For testing we're running everything at stock speeds, with the RAM at the max Intel rating of DDR3 1066, without XMP. Starting off with Cinebench R15, the G465 scored 63 points in the single-threaded test and 83 in the multi-threaded test, so hyper-threading brought a 32% uplift here. In multi-thread the T9550 was 74% faster, but in single-thread that shrinks to around a 25% advantage for the Penryn. Moving on to the Octane 2.0 JavaScript benchmark, Things went a bit better for the G465, here it scored 11,753 points. The T9550 only scored 32% higher here, and the i5-2520M scored twice as many points. The i7-2600K nearly three times. Onto the Speedometer 2.0 web app responsiveness test. The G465 scored 31.5 runs per minute. The T9550 achieved 53% more runs. The i5-2520M 79% more, and the 2600K did 170% more. Things are even less great in the multi-threaded Pauvre, where the G465 only scored 157 points. Here the T9550 scored double the points, the i5-2520M over 3 times as much, and the 2600K over 8 times as much. Moving on to Ycruncher, a multi-threaded app that computes Pi. It took the G465 1126 seconds to complete the computation. The T9550 only took about half the time, the i5-2520M less than a third, and the i7-2600K only about an eighth of the time. On to 7-zip, where things are equally bad for the G465, scoring only 3461 MIPS on the compression and 3638 MIPS on the decompression. The i5-2520M scored around 3 times as many MIPS, and the i7-2600K around 7 times as many. And lastly, CPU-Z. Here the G465 scored 123.9 points on the single-threaded test, and 224.7 on the multi-threaded test. So hyper-threading brought a really big uplift in performance here, over 80% better. But it still wasn't enough to come close to the T9550 though and the i5-2520M scored well over 3 times as many points, and the 2600K over 8 times. So all in all for raw compute performance, the G465 isn't looking very good, but we probably weren't expecting otherwise. So far we've discussed gaming performance with a discrete GPU, but the G465 also comes equipped with an integrated GPU, the lowest tier of Intel HD graphics for the Sandy Bridge generation, with 6 execution units and a boost clock of 1 GHz. I wasn't expecting much out of this, especially now that the memory controller is having to deal with both the CPU and the GPU. And well, it wasn't pretty, starting with Minecraft I dropped the settings all the way down to the bare minimum to have some kind of playability, but most of the time it was still a stuttery mess with performance ranging from 45 to 1 FPS. And here's Mafia 2 with the lowest settings at 1024x768, and it would run at around 12 FPS. Performance was consistent, but not playable. As for a synthetic test, in 3 Mark Ice Storm it scored 14,200 points for the graphics score.
Unfortunately, we don't have an unlocked multiplier to overclock this chip with. I did try base clock overclocking, but I found it to be so limited I didn't bother testing it. However, one of the advantages of running this CPU on a higher tier chipset like this is that we can run memory speeds faster than those specified by Intel. And I was surprised to find out that this chip would easily run XMP DDR3-2133. And I was hoping that this would bring a performance uplift to this rather poor chip, but that wasn't the case. At most saw a 3% improvement in 7-zip, but overall over the test there wasn't a lot in it. For the iGPU I was expecting a larger performance uplift as the GPU has to use the system memory. However in 3 Mark iStorm there was also only about a 3% increase in the GPU performance. So to conclude, what do I make of this processor? Well let's go back to the questions I had at the start of this video. What's the performance like? Well overall it's just very poor. Could you play any modern games on it? Well apart from a few edge cases, no. And Please don't try for your own good. And lastly, what was Intel thinking selling a product like this? Well, as we've seen, the performance in terms of processing power is very poor, but it also definitely has some strong points. It runs very, very cool, and it uses very little power. We saw a CPU package power of 6 to 11 watts, and for a desktop chip that's basically nothing. And most importantly, the same goes for the price. Intel suggests a price of $37, and as CPUs go, that is really, really cheap. Uh, for comparison, a mid-range i3 was around three times as much, and an i7-2600K eight times as much. So when viewed in that light, I'd say you could forgive some of its shortcomings, and probably could have been a neat little chip for a system where very little processing power is required. However, doesn't necessarily mean I would have recommended it, because even at that point the writing had been on the wall for many years for these single core chips, and as we've seen it was only barely adequate for even the most basic of tasks in Windows 10. So not a terrible product per se, but I'm glad Intel finally ditched these single core CPUs after Sandy Bridge. Well, that was all for now. I hope you have enjoyed this video, and if you did, a like would be much appreciated. If you want to be kept up to date on future videos, why not consider subscribing and ringing that bell icon? And I'm curious, what are your thoughts on these uh, single core chips or your own experiences? Do leave them in the comment section below. Well, that was all for now, and bye bye.